Joel chapter number 1. Again, reading verse number 1. The Bible says, The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and let their children another generation. That which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. Now, verse number four is referring to a literal famine. You will recall that one of the plagues at a that was set upon Egypt was the locusts. Well, why are locusts such an issue? Because when they show up, they eat everything and they don't leave nothing behind. That's what we've been led to believe. Well, in this verse, okay, locusts were second in line. First one was the palmer worm. Okay, then the locust came, then the canker worm, and then after them, the caterpillar. If you study it out, we don't have time to get into it, but if you study it out, each one of those animals had a specific diet. Also, each one of those insects, if you will, okay, I know worms aren't insects, but bear with me, okay? But those insects and these herbivores, they have not only different diets, they're different sizes if you study them out. It's saying it didn't matter if it was big, if it was small, they ate everything, right? Nothing was left hanging on the tree. Nothing was left on the stalk. Nothing was left on the vine. Because by the time all of these guys got done, there wasn't anything left. And as you progress, you would think, well, if, if they got their fill, surely there's something left. Well, no, then the locusts came. And, and as it goes down, it's saying there wasn't even crumbs left to fall off of the table. Okay, they've taken all of the blessings of the field. Well, verse number two, who's Joel speaking to? He's speaking to the elder generation. He's saying, hey, y'all been around a while. Answer a question for me. He says, give ear all ye inhabitants. Well, he says, hear this, ye old men, give ear all the inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days? He says, everybody listen up. I've called out the elders for a reason. They've been around longer than anybody else. He says, y'all ever seen anything like this in your time? And then he takes it one step backwards. He says, how about in the days of your fathers? He's saying, that's not just the generation before the other. He says, that's in perpetuity. Okay, many times in the Bible it says that they went to go sleep with their fathers. Right? When it refers to their fathers... It's not just talking about the generation that came before them. It's talking about the history of Israel. He's saying, go search the record books. Okay, go study out the history. Tell me if you've ever seen it as bad as it's been right now. That's what he's asking. He said, you ever seen anything like this? Like we've seen locusts on their own before. He says, we may have seen palmer worm on their own before. We may have had infestations of caterpillar before, okay, or canker worm. He says, but we've never seen them all at the same time. And he says, in the past, when one would come, there'd still be some left over. They wouldn't take everything. He says, God sent them all at one time. And then as you study the rest of the book of Joel, you'll find out that that was a judgment from the Lord because Israel had been doing wicked in the eyes of the Lord. But look with me in verse number 3. He asked him the question, and then he says, I don't want the answer. Joel already knew the answer. Keep in mind, this is a message that Joel's delivering to Israel on behalf of God. God didn't need them to answer him. God do. So he poses them a question, and then he says in verse number 3, Tell ye your children of it. He says, don't give me the answer. Go tell your kids. He says, go tell your grandkids. And let your grandkids tell the next generation. In other words, 
this is so bad it ought never be forgotten now don't know about you brother Adrian I would have taken it as a promise or a little bit of silver lining that God said go tell your children and let the children tell their children and let your grandchildren tell their children whether they realize it or not God promised that some of them was going to survive that alone should have been enough yeah it's bad but there's going to be another generation but he says tell your kids about it then instill it with enough purpose and importance in your kids that they go to tell the grandkids about it and then they should fear and know how important and dangerous of a situation this was that they warn the next generation about it he says that's not God's job to pass it down from generation to generation he says that's your job he asks them the question but he says tell your children let them tell their children now see if you study the Bible many times not just Israel but other places even in the New Testament some people just assumed that God was going to do something they just thought, oh, well, God will take care of it. Only to show up and find out that God takes very important, or takes, thinks it's very important and takes things very seriously when he said to do something and you don't do it. God does not reward the things that we do as if they're a contract. There's nothing that you can do to merit one ounce or one single act of God's mercy or grace. It's not because you pray that God answers your prayer. God answers your prayer out of an act of grace and mercy because He promised to do it. Your prayer is obedience because God commanded you to pray. God wants to answer, but He can't until you're obedient. God's the one that gave you the power to pray. The Bible says that God gave unto every man a measure of faith. Without faith, you couldn't pray. Then after you get saved, guess what? He gave you the Holy Ghost, the mediator, the intercessor, the one that delivers the message to the intercessor. Who's, who's that? That's Christ. Even when you pray, God's doing all of the legwork for you. Your prayer is taken to Amen. our high priest, Who's seated at the right hand of the Father? Who's that? Christ. And what's the Bible say that Christ is doing? Seated at the right hand of the Father. Ever making intercession for us. Even when you pray, the Bible teaches that it's as if you walk into the throne room of heaven. But because right now we don't have a glorified body and we can't walk into the very throne room of God in heaven, God does everything for us to make it as if we were in the throne room of heaven. It's not that you're a great and powerful prayer warrior. The best that we can be is somebody that just bears our heart unto God. The only reason that any, answer, that any prayer is ever answered is because God wills it to be so. God does not fight the battles of his followers because they prepared well enough ahead of time. God doesn't show up and bring victory in every situation because somebody got up and gave a good enough pep speech or preached a good enough message beforehand that when the battle started going, God said, you know what, I do want to help them. No, the Lord fights the battles for those that do what? Trust in Him, rely upon Him, and are positioned where He positioned them. You want God not to show up and fight your battle for you? Show up at the wrong place. Right? Get out of the will of God and see how often God's going to fight your battle for you. You want God to fight your battle for you? Okay. Well, show up without any of the stuff that he told you to have on. The whole armor of God, without the shield of faith, without the sword, the word. Show up unprepared and see if God's going to fight that battle for you. 
Show up in a cocky attitude and see if the Lord fights the battle for you. If you show up welled up with pride, God's liable to let you fall flat on your face in the middle of the battle. Because pride goeth before destruction. If a man thinketh he stand, let him take heed, lest what? He fall. Joe's saying, God's not going to tell your generation about the next generation. He says, that's not God's job. That's your job. From the moment that they crossed over into Canaan land. Right? When they took the ark, bore it upon the shoulders of the people, they stepped, and when their foot hit the water, was committed to the water, that's when God split the River Jordan. From that moment forward, you will find people making monuments not to men, not to things that men had done, not even to the acts of God. They were monuments to God's power and God's faithfulness. That altar that... Y'all following with me? The altar that Joshua made in the middle of the River Jordan where no man could have gone out there and walked where the water was so deep and so strong that rocks couldn't have just you know, naturally formed up into that pile. Somebody had to walk out there in order to build that. And in order for that to happen, the water had to be stopped. You know why that altar was put there? It wasn't to show how great Joshua was. It wasn't put there to show that Israel was God's chosen people. It was put there as a sign that God promised one day we was going to cross over into the promised land called Canaan. Joshua was one of the spies that went and spied it out. He was one of the only two that said, if God said it's ours, let's go take it. Joshua had a lot of faith. Because there's giants and there were, yes, wonderful blessings. of the land that flowed with milk and honey and they had to carry a bundle of grapes on a stick that borne on the shoulders between two of them. They said, there's a lot out there we don't know, but I know God said it's ours. That's Joshua and Caleb. The rest of them didn't get to see promised land. Didn't get to see Canaan land. That monument was a testimony to God's faithfulness in spite of Israel's unfaithfulness. That monument said, even though the old generation didn't believe him, God still did it anyway. Amen. They had to fall off the face of the earth they had to pass away even Moses because of his disobedience didn't get to see promised land but as Joshua was going across he says let's build a monument right here a reminder that even though a whole lot of them say it's impossible with God it's still possible he's faithful he has the power to do it and if he promised to do it he can make sure that it's fulfilled. But nowhere does God promise that he's going to tell your children what they need to know about the Lord. Nowhere does it say that God's going to warn the next generation about the wolves in sheep's clothing. Nowhere in your Bible does it say that if you neglect your duty to raise up the next generation or the generation after that or the generation after that, that God will step in and educate them in the way that they should. Now see, we are very apt that when we read the Bible, we can become easily judgmental. Okay? If you're reading the Old Testament, you're studying the history of Israel, you do realize that within like two verses, that could have been 60 years. You know how much happens in 60 years? Right? Personally, as a society, economically. We just see that one king was unfaithful, the next king was unfaithful, the next king was unfaithful. And we say, well, they should have known better. Yeah, they probably should have known better. But God had records of everything that he told them. Yeah, but the guy before him had shut them up, locked them up with a key, and thrown away the key. Right? The things that God had instructed them to hand down had been sealed and secreted away. That's why God in his 
faithfulness and his long suffering would raise up a prophet every now and then to say hey go dust those books off because what's in those books is what we need restore return to the old paths get back to where we're supposed to be but even then God didn't tell them everything they needed to know God sent a man to bring what? conviction to show them that what had been done up to that point was wrong that's why they had suffered judgment at the hand of God it was still those people's responsibility to get into those books and study out what it was in the eyes of God that he deemed acceptable God didn't show up and all over again say, okay, here's the Ten Commandments, here's the law, here's what I taught Moses. No, they had to go study it out for themselves. Joel shows up and he already knows the answer because God's told him. Joel shows up and says, hey, God wants to know. Y'all ever seen it as bad as it is right now? He says, not even you. Go back and... Anybody ever heard a report... For many of you fathers of the old generations, that it was ever as bad as it is right now. That we had an infestation to where all of the things, all the critters, the creepy crawlies, okay, all of them were filled, and by the time they left, there wasn't anything left. It's like when the Grinch showed up and took everything, all the presents, right? He even took the trees. Right? He took all the things hanging on the tree. He took everything but the nails that were used to hold it to the wall. There wasn't anything left. Wasn't anything that you could find joy or that you could find pleasure in. Joel says, you ever seen it that bad? And he knows the answer. The answer is no. It's never been as bad as it's been right now. Which springboards into why this judgment came because they had gotten worse than they'd ever been before. God was trying to turn them back to the Lord. But it's that notion in verse number 3 where he says, Tell ye your children of it. Then it says, And let your children tell their children. And their children another generation. Joel is pointing out to them that there's a lot of things that we do hand down. Okay? If y'all know me, I don't watch sports all that much anymore. I got tired of being angry all the time. Okay? You can't be a Bengal or a Reds fan and be happy. Okay? So I just stopped being one. Okay? For a while there, it was pretty good being a Clemson college football fan until what? Until everybody else caught up. Okay, we were the underdogs for a while, and then everybody came after us, and then, I mean, they're still good, but they're not number one every year. They're not battling for championships, okay? Through my dad's side, I've got a lot of Buckeye, right, fandom that I could have handed down to me. Now, don't get me wrong. I like watching it. I just, I'm not invested anymore. I'll watch anything, and whoever you're rooting for, I'm going to root for the other guy just to irritate you. That's what I think is fun nowadays. Okay? But you'll never catch me rooting for Michigan. Anyway. <laughs> right? There are people that hate this college called Louisville because it was handed down to them. It was taught to them by the generation that came before them. Okay? There's a true story about two families called the Hatfields and McCoys. Nobody remembers why they hate each other. They just know that they hate each other. And it gets handed down to the next... It's taught to them that way. You say, well, Brother Jordan, those are pretty simple. It's, there's a whole mess going on over in the Middle East right now because that's been handed down and taught from one generation to the next. Amen. That there are certain things that people think are important enough to hand down. Joel's saying, why don't you also hand down the memories of when God sends judgment? He's saying if it's worth passing down the frivolous things or things that you know when it comes to eternity don't hold a drop of water in a bucket. He says why isn't it worth handing down things that actually might make a difference in their life? He says ye old men. They should have known better. He starts with the elderly generation. They know that where 
they train up a child, that's the way that they're going to go. I mean, we can assume that if he's talking to the elders, the elders might have grown children already. But yet he's telling them, go tell your sons and daughters. I don't care that they're grown. You missed a part of their training, of their education. He says, and make sure they know it's important enough to hand it down to their kids. But there are certain things that we must assume. Right? When's the Lord coming back, Brother Jordan? I believe it's soon, but I can't give you a date. People have believed that it's always been in their time since Jesus went home to glory. I mean, John, at the end of the book of Revelation, he says, Lord, soon and very soon. He just saw the end times, and he's still saying, Lord, come as quick as you can. When's it going to be, Brother Jordan? I don't know. Now, the way my brain works, I'm very linear thinking, okay? I struggled with this for a while, Brother Adrian. I don't see a point in putting in retirement funds if I think Jesus is coming back. But there's a good chance that I could be wrong. Not that God's wrong, but like, what's the point in having a retirement if Jesus comes back? I don't want to leave it to the devil, okay? But see, it'd be foolish not to prepare for a day. Right? The Bible teaches we what we shouldn't say is tomorrow we're going to go down there and buy and sell and get gain. I don't know what tomorrow brings forth. I don't know how many tomorrows I've got. I may not even make it to retirement age and the Lord still not come back. Right? He may take me out of here. I don't know. But what I do know is, is that God taught that we are supposed to be good stewards and stewards prepare for a tomorrow whether or not it comes. I wrestled with that for a little bit. Okay, now, there are a lot of people that look at what's going on in the world today and they say, well, if it's that bad, there's no sense in trying anymore. Or they think it's so bad that soon it's just all going to be over. Well, that may be true, but it may not be true. Some people think, well, surely this guy will get everything sorted out and we don't need to hand these truths down to people anymore. This is how bad history's gotten. Okay? This wasn't anywhere in the notes, but you're welcome. <laughs> History has been so misconstrued now that people believe that Hitler and Stalin are on complete opposites of the political spectrum. No. They's on the same side. The same side that... Not, I'm not talking political alliances. They were a part of the philosophy that one man should be in charge of everything. That's called a totalitarian dictatorship. Amen. They say, well, Hitler was uber conservative. No, he wasn't. Amen. It, it was called the National Socialist Party. Amen. That's as far left as you can get. Amen. And they say, oh, well, Stalin, he was the one that was all very liberal. A liberal. He was more conservative than Hitler was in some of his policies. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? They'll put a spin on what's in the history books to prove what they want to prove. Amen. You can't trust somebody else to tell your kids what's true and what's not true. You can't trust somebody else to teach your grandkids what's worth learning because they were never taught it. Hey, saying it's not anybody else's responsibility except the elder generation. He says, if your kids aren't already instilling those truths, if your kids haven't adopted the principles that God says are worth adopting, he says, it doesn't fall on anybody's shoulders but yours. He says, even if you taught them, he said, if you didn't instill into them the idea that it was important enough to teach the next generation, he said, you failed. He says, because what God's judging you for right now, you should want every generation to know about after so that they don't have to be judged for the same thing. That's why he's saying to pass it down to generation to generation. He says, it's as bad as it's ever been, and unless you want your descendants to go through it the exact same way that you did, make sure that they hear about it. 
Make sure that they know why you were judged and make sure they know what God said about how it should have been done in the first place. And make sure you stress the point that it was so bad we wanted you to know about it so you wouldn't go through the same thing. On the vice versa of that, it should also be the elder generation's duty and responsibility that when things are on the mountaintop, you relay it in the right frame point with the right amount of respect and reverence, but you instill in somebody else, that's worth attaining. It's worth it so much, I've spent my entire life pursuing it. And even though the world thinks that this or this or this or that is worth spending a life chasing, what you're really looking for is up there. It's called fellowship with God. Right? It's dwelling in the presence of an almighty God. It's about getting as close as you can to where you almost think He's going to pull the veil back and you can actually see Him. It's about getting so close to Him that other people think that you audibly hear His voice. You don't have to. If you just walk close to Him, you'll know what God thinks about things. He says, if you would have instilled that and the importance of it into the next generation, judgment wouldn't have had to come. He's saying your elders and your fathers failed you because somebody thought that that wasn't worth passing down. He says you're not being judged today because God hates you. He's saying judgment came so that you could understand that God wants to correct you, but God wants to correct you because He loves you. He doesn't want you to stay in the state that you're in. He said that's why judgment came. He said, but the reason that you're being judged is because your fathers and their fathers and the fathers before them, somebody didn't think it was important enough to instill into the next generation why it was so important to chase after and to cling to the things of God. Because at some point, the last person that truly was clinging on to the things of the Lord, they went off the scene. Why wasn't there somebody else there to take up the mantle? See, if you study out the way that God does things, God always trains up a next generation. If people are, one, faithful enough to go and teach them, but two, the next generation is faithful to answer the call. What happened when Elijah got taken out of here? Elisha was there. In fact, as Elijah was taken up, what came down? The mantle. It fell upon him. And what did he do when he got back to the river? He folded it up and he slapped the water like he'd saw the man of God do. And God said, yep, I'm still here. The water parted. Walked across on dry ground. Was it because it was the mantle or was it because he did things the way that the man of God had done it before? No. But God wanted to show him that, yep, if you do things the way that Elijah did, I'll be with you too. And if you study it out, Elisha did twice as many miracles and works for God than Elijah did. In fact, Elisha had so much God on him that his bones were in the, in the tomb. They threw a dead fellow in and he touched the bones of the prophet and he came out walking and talking. That's how much God Elisha had on him. But what happened between Elisha and this generation? What happened between Jeremiah and this generation? Even in Jeremiah's day, we don't have record of one convert. Even in Elijah's day, he thought that he was the last one until God spoke to him under the juniper tree and said, nope, I've still got followers over there that haven't defiled themselves, haven't bowed the knee. Amen. He says, you're not in this alone. There's still some that are on the winning side. But in order for it to get to where it had gotten in Joel chapter number 1, a lot of people had to leave the stuff. They didn't stick by the stuff. Now, I don't have time to get into all of what's going on in the world, but you know why the world's the way that the world is today? Because a lot of people didn't stick by the stuff. But that's no excuse that you shouldn't stick by the stuff. 
Joel tells them, the elder generation, he says, have you ever seen it as bad in your lifetime? He knows that the answer is no. Look at what's going on in the world. Have you ever seen it as bad as it is right now? The answer is no. Then he says, have you seen it or even heard about it being this bad in the days of your fathers? If I go back, I don't know. There have been horrible wars throughout history. I don't see the breakdown of society and the very things that hold a functioning culture together like respect for one another and respect for authority. I don't see where it's ever been as bad as it is right now. Have there been times where famine has been worse? Absolutely. Have there been times that wars were more devastating than they are in our day and age? Absolutely. But from that answer, he's not asking them if it's as bad as it ever... He said, have you ever seen a famine as bad as this? Have you ever seen a society that's so broken down and discombobulated and dysfunctional as what we've got right now? I don't think that we've seen it. Maybe wrong. But then he turns around and he says, knowing that they weren't taught the way that they were supposed to have been taught. Knowing that when they had the ability to make the choice, they're the elders now. They're the ones that called the shots. But when they had the chance to seek out what was right or what was true, what did they do? They either continued in what they were taught or they tried to find something new that still was outside of God's approval. That's what's going on today. People are willing to try anything as long as it's anything but the way that mom and dad used to do it. They want to make a name for them. They want to prove that their way was correct or they were smart enough that they didn't need the generation before them. There's just one problem. If there hadn't have been a generation before them, there wouldn't be them. There wouldn't be everything that they're using and abusing right, to try and make a name for themselves. No, I'm not going to say that. I'm going to be good. I'm going to be nice. Holy Ghost said not to say it. We're not going to say it. But knowing that they had the choice to go out and search out truth and instead chose to continue in what he says, that's no excuse. What they did is no excuse for what you're doing today. You still had the choice. And he says, but it's on you. Your kids aren't going to learn what is right unless you teach them. He says, your kids aren't going to learn what's expected or what's even possible with God. Because long before people forgot about the monuments, the people that started talking about the monuments and would remind them why those stones were out in the middle of the River Jordan, they stopped talking about it. They stopped pointing out the significance of it. They stop conveying to others, no, that's not just a stack of stones out there. Go ahead, go and try and walk out there into the Jordan River. And then somebody would start, and then they'd give up real quick and they'd pull them back in with a rope and say, see, you just can't walk out there and stack up some stones. But they walked across on dry ground. He says, what do you think would happen if you just chucked a stone into there? The current's going to take it before it gets to the bottom. He says, that wasn't luck, that wasn't an accident. God parted the waters and they built that as a reminder that they walked where no man had walked before to get to a place that God had promised them. You know why people nowadays just think it's just going to church? Because for too long people have treated it just like going to church. No, we've come to worship a thrice holy God in a place that was set aside and reserved and sanctified unto Him for His honor and His glory. It's why I reuse that devotion every now and then. Talking from the book of Ecclesiastes, we should watch our feet when we enter into the house of God. We should watch what words come out of our mouth. Because if we don't, if we treat this just like another building, if we treat this as a place where people just come together to meet, we trample not only the blood of Christ under our feet, we trample the blood of all the martyrs and those that came before us, the prayers of the saints that were answered when a nation was founded that had religious freedom so that they could assemble in a building like ours today. All of those things are trampled under our feet and we're daring God to judge us 
for our lack of consideration towards what he provided to us. Very serious. But no, used to, I've heard tell, it's still this case usually around here, but if you tell somebody, hey, I'm headed to church, they understand why you're dressed up. It's still called your Sunday best for a reason. Even the world knows that what you wear on Sunday, because where do you go on Sunday? Church. What you wear to church should be your best. They may not know why, but that is stuck in society even to this day. Why? Because God deserves our best. I deserve to come in in sackcloth. I deserve to come in crawling on my hands and knees. But no, God's given me a good pair of shoes. And He's given me nice clothing. And I ought to, out of respect, reverence, and appreciation for what He's given to me, show up in my best. Now, your best and my best may be different. But best is not judged off of one person. Best is judged off of each individual. Best is a mindset. If you're wearing your best, you ought to act your best. If you're acting your best, then when you come in, you're on your best behavior. You're conscious of what you're saying, how you do things. If you accidentally stepped out and somebody, oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't, didn't mean to offend you. Y'all know that. I do that all the time. It's an accident. I'm a bull in a shiny shop. Amen. But that little tidbit of Sunday best still goes on in society today. Why is that? Because it used to be a daily thing that was drilled into everyone. And there are still some that remember fragments, but they haven't been told the complete story. They don't understand why it's important to wear your best on Sundays, not because it's Sunday, but because of where you go on Sunday. Not because of where you're going, but who you're going for, Him. Amen. It's not about the place, it's about the person that you're going to have fellowship with, that you're going to praise and to worship that you're going to meet at his house so that you can roll some burdens off of you and put them down on the altar. Because there is something special about coming to a place that's called the altar. I know you've got your own prayer closet. And I know you've got places that you deal with God, but every now and then there's just something about getting it to the altar. Why have those things become not just second place, they've become rarities in our day and age. Just start popping into churches around here and see how many of them still have altars. Instead, they've got stages. Or they've got amphitheaters that they're calling a church. Start randomly popping into churches and see how many of them still have designated pianos or organs. Most of the time, they are Keyboards that can be taken down and brought out whenever they need them. Because they need more room on the stage for all of their activities. Now, Brother Randy, I'm not the most animated guy, especially during Sunday school. But ever, it has been on a few occasions that if I really get with it, I'll start walking around. Right? I've taught and preached in things where I felt like I was like this and where I've got plenty of room on each side. It don't bother me where. If God gives you a place, you're appreciative for the place. And if God gives me the opportunity, whether it's teaching, preaching, or testifying, or something in between, if He says go, I'm going to go at the drop of a hat. doesn't matter where it's at. It's not about the building or what you can do in the building it's about who gave you the building mm -hmm. now why do we design it the way we, because we d believe that God deserves the best building we're going to build it the best that we can with what God blessed us to build it with what are we going to fill it with the things that God has blessed us to be able to have you know where this pulpit came from came from the old building as far as I know it's the only pulpit that's ever been used they thought about getting another one. But a pastor just 
felt that it'd be wrong with as much God had been preached behind this one to throw it up. Why? Because this has been touched. It's felt the presence of God. Another one may look prettier or it may fit the seem a little bit better, but this one has heard preaching and heard righteousness from behind it for a long time. Amen. You can't replace that. God saw fit to use this originally. We're going to respect and honor the fact that God saw fit to use it. You do realize the staff of Aaron that budded, that ended up inside of the Ark of the Covenant, that's just a regular stick before God touched it. You realize that those stone tablets that had the Ten Commandments written on them, before God touched them, they just rock. You say, well, why did they put them in such a special place? And why did they put that pot of manna in there with them? It wasn't about what was in it. It was the fact that God used what was in it. It was a reminder that God did what He promised He would do. That God did things that man could not do. Man can get up and preach behind this pulpit in the power of the flesh. It ain't going to do nothing. You know why this pulpit was held on to? Because the messages that were delivered from behind it, the Spirit, once it crossed right here, and once it got piped through those sound systems, the Holy Spirit took it and He changed people's lives with it. Amen. It wasn't about the man and it wasn't about the message. It was about the fact that some people came in and they gave their best. The preacher studied his best. They meditated his best. The people in the audience came in prepared the best that they could come in prepared. They received it as best they knew how. And they dealt with God as best they could and God honored it. And God did things that we could not do. God knitted families back together and put homes together. Saved people from the fiery region to the dam. He took addictions away that society said they would never give up. I'm talking about things I've seen in this room and in the old room over there. You can ask Miss Brittany and Brother Josh. I remember in the old building when they said Miss Brittany couldn't have kids. And I heard the request with my audible ears where she said, it may be selfish, but could you pray that if the Lord willed it, that I'd be able to carry one. And I was there when people hit the altar with a broken heart praying for one of their church members or their fellow church members. And I've been here ever since when they carted in all the new ones, just one after the other. One of them born on my birthday, Miss Chloe. We share a birthday. We're also the only two that have anything red going on. I don't know what that means either. But what are you saying? I've seen what God has done when people humbly come in and they just offer their best. And when they say, Lord, I know that we don't deserve it. But we believe that we could be better for you if we had this. And if it be in your will, could you please bless us with it? And I've seen them do it time and time and time again. That's worth instilling the importance of in the next generation. Because the generation before us, they didn't. That's why so many abandoned it. And the generation before that didn't instill the dangers of falling away from it because in between my great-grandfather and grandfather's generation, in that age, there were more break breakings and fracturings away from true doctrine that nowadays people just come to accept Y'all do understand, if I offend anyone, I am sorry, but the Southern Baptist Convention's not biblical. It goes against the ordinances and the doctrine of the local church. Y'all do I understand that people get saved out of the Methodist and Lutheran and other denominations, but y'all do realize the reason they're called something different is because that's not what the Bible teaches. The Lutherans follow what Martin Luther originally taught. He understood that what the priest had been teaching wasn't in the Bible, but Luther still missed some of it. He didn't get it all right. There are some things that are worth doing right. Amen. And those distinctives, people stopped caring about 
well, we're mostly the same. Well, mostly the same still means different. There are some things that are worth defining and keeping separated. I mean, there's a, what is it now? We're up to like over 50 Baptist denominations just in America. Who knows what's going on anywhere else? Why is that? Because somebody got caught up on details and instead of focusing on what was best, they started offering what they thought God deserved. No, God deserves our best. Well, wouldn't it be easier if we all did this? Best is not easy. What did God give for you? His best, His only begotten. What did He provide for you? The best salvation. You know why it's best? All you have to do is accept it. Because He took care of everything else. Because He knew that you couldn't earn any part of it. Amen. So He paid for it. He provided it. And He petitions you to come and receive it. All you got to do is accept it. That's best. He deserves our best, not what's convenient, not what we're comfortable with. He deserves our best. The doctrine of best is what has not been handed down from generation to generation. How do we worship? We worship our best because He deserves it. When we go and witness, how do we witness? We witness the best that we can by the guidance of the Holy Ghost because my best still doesn't carry a drop in the bucket to God I'd rather do it his way than my way so I'll do my best to follow him how do we teach under the leading and guiding of the Holy Ghost and under the unction of the Holy Spirit because my words aren't going to help you my preaching may get you excited but it's not going to make any difference for all of eternity I say what I say because I believe and to my best believe that that's exactly what God would have me to say. Because if I didn't believe it, I'd say it a different way. How do we attend the best we can as servants? I'm here to offer up praise and worship to God but I've been called to His service. I'm looking to see if there are others that I'm fitly framed with who need their burden born a little bit. Bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. I'm looking for those that might be hurting so that I can, like the good Samaritan, take them to an end and get them patched up and bandaged for a while. I'm looking around at others the best I can to see who God wants to give me an opportunity to go over and be an encouragement to, to edify, to exhort, Maybe never even mention anything to him, but he gives me a burden to offer up supplication and intercessory prayer for him. And when I do it, I do it the best that I know how. I'm not saying you've got to do it as good as Christ did. Christ just said, I expect you best. Here's the thing about best. You know whether or not you gave you best. Nobody needs to tell you what your best is. You know if you could have done more. And you know that you did everything you can because you know how much less you could have done. You know whether you were all in or whether you held some in reserve. There's no gear shift in God's spirituality. It's just got two modes, on and off. You're either all in and you're giving your best or you're not all in. Now God winks at our ignorance and sometimes God, because somebody has made themselves available to God, will use somebody that you think didn't deserve to be used. But God's standard has always been your best. Since the beginning. You know what God wanted from Adam and Eve? Their best. You know what their best included? Obedience. They chose to embrace disobedience. You know what God expected from Cain and Abel? Their best. You know what Cain gave up? What he was willing to offer. Not his best, but what he was willing to let go of. That's why God didn't accept it. 
God's not complicated. People make religion complicated. People make spirituality difficult. God has promised, you can have all of me, all I desire is all of you. That seems like a pretty uneven trade that we get all of God and all He gets is us. But in God's eyes, He says, if I desire all of you, I'm willing to give all of me. That's how serious God is about desiring a relationship with you. Well, all of you means your best. Because God's going to sort out the things that He's not pleased with if you give Him all of you. He's going to work that clay. He's going to make you into a vessel of honor. But unless you're willing to let God bring out the best in you, He's not going to do it. If you resist getting on the potter's table, letting the potter work and knead you and move those impurities out of you, if you buck against it, God's not going to force it on you. You've got to be willing to be on your best behavior. You've got to be willing to give your best submissive heart. Well, Lord, I was pretty, I was pretty faithful today. I ain't going to cut it. It's your best. Well, Lord, I did like 98% of the things you told me that was at your best. I don't care what score you gave yourself. There's only one score that God cares about. Your best. Did you put in the best effort or did you put in the effort you were willing to give? Did you pray with your best fervor? Did you pray with your best intensity? Did you separate yourself from the world the best that you could or did you separate just enough to make yourself feel better? That's what hadn't been handed down. People like comparing to other people. That's not how God does it. God compares it to Himself. He says, I gave my best. Did you give your best? I don't care what they did. Don't care how they showed up. Don't care what attitude they had when they came to church. I'm talking about you. God says, we'll get to them eventually. Right? That's not your job. That's my job. I'm talking about you. He says, just between you and me, did you give your best? It's the only standard God has. Either you listened your best and you followed your best and you did your best or you fell short of what God expected from you. You say, well, that's harsh, Brother Jordan. You don't get A's for effort. You get A's for following through. Effort will get you a long ways. But unless you're willing to put your nose to the grindstone and give it your best, you left something out there on the table. You left something that God deserved and you saved it for something else. If we instill that in the next generation, if we can get that desire for that kind of Christianity back, there's no telling what will happen. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.